Thank you, everyone. I, I actually have the easiest job here because I am introducing a, a very dynamic person that everybody knows. Um, I am not a um, born and raised Minnesotan. I'm a transplant, but I, I, it must have been two weeks into Minnesota when I heard about Rondo. That is a legacy that is enduring. It's a wound that has not yet healed. And those who lived through that experience have a uniqueness that, you know, people maybe in other parts of the country don't know about. But I have also the singular honor of introducing Debbie Montgomery. I happen to know from interviewing a few people in the community that Debbie Montgomery grew up in Rondo, played in the streets of Rondo, went to school in Rondo, and served that community faithfully for many years. So uh, she's raised her four children there, and she currently resides um, with her husband, Robert, there. So she has not disconnected herself from the importance of Rondo in all these years. Um, Debbie graduated from St. Paul Central High School, where she um, then went on to earn a Bachelor of Arts um, degree in political science and sociology from the University of Minnesota, and then a Master of Arts degree in public safety administration from the University of St. Thomas. Among other career endeavors, Debbie worked as a city planner, budget analyst, and an assistant grants aid coordinator in St. Paul's Planning and Economic Development Department. Are you tired? <laughs> <laughs> After five years of service in PED, Debbie joined the St. Paul Police Department as the first African-American female police officer and retired as a senior commander in the St. Paul Police Office Department. She also served the, the city of St. Paul as council member um, toward one for four years. That is where I had the pleasure of, of meeting Debbie. So let's welcome this remarkable woman um, with a very warm hand clap on this cold winter day. I think I'm, I think I'm live. Uh, one, thank you all for coming. Uh, the fact that you even got to work is a start. I had to call my fellow police officer to get a ride down here. <laughs> my car was buried. Um, one, I'm very honored to talk to you today about my experience. And I'm going to lead you up to, they wanted me to talk about the march from Selma to Montgomery, but I want to lead you up to it because there's a lot that got me to where I was at and why I did what I did. Um, as she said, I was born and raised here. But I started in this community, the village of Rondo, and it was that community that got me involved with the civil rights movement. Um, I grew up in St. Philip's Episcopal Church, and Father Denzel Cardi was one of the leaders of the um, civil rights movement up in, here in Minnesota. And so between all of that activity, that's where I got my inspiration because I became the president of the St. Paul NAACP Youth Group. And back in the day when young people knew about what was going on and were current and actually participating, uh, we had 650 youth members in the NAACP, which was the largest youth membership that we had from this area. Uh, at, at the age of 17, having uh, ran through all of that, uh, Allie Mae Hampton was our young director for the um, NAACP youth group. At the age of 17, um, I was privileged enough to get elected to the National Board of Directors of the NAACP, where I served with Thurgood Marshall, Margaret Bush Wilson, Roy Wilkins. And it just gives you some idea of the number of people who have been involved in the civil rights movement. And it just inspired me to learn as much as I could and to get involved and then come back to Minnesota, which at that time we only had about 270,000 uh, people of, of uh, African American descent up here at that time. So, um, but we had a large civil rights presence. Um, like I say, Roy Wilkins grew up here, Carl Rowan. We had just a lot of people that were involved in it at different levels. So um, I just want to give you that kind of background. When I was on the national board, um, we had a lot of policy decisions that we had to make. And we worked our way through 
those policy decisions uh, with our attorneys, with our board, and, and the regional things. At the age of 19, when I had graduated uh, from, the U, from uh, Central High School and went to the University of Minnesota, I got involved with the uh, Cura Center uh, with Matt Stark. And that's when we really got the bus ride to go uh, to Selma. Ja Jack Nicholson, who was uh, one of the leaders of the um, SCLC, the Southern Christian Leadership Group, and he worked to organize, and he was with the NAACP, to organize voter rights down south. And he actually was down there for like three months, helping to do, get voter registration and stuff. And the interesting piece about all of that was he got so involved, he came back and talked to Matt at the University of Minnesota, who was in the sociology uh, area. And he said, we need to take young people down there so they can actually get involved and understand, not read about it, not look at it on TV, so they get a real sense of what's really going on out in the world. So, um, and we had, I'll give you some names of people, because I, I had to bring this back. I, have the, I had to go to the, uh, the um, Library of Congress <laughs> to get some uh, articles because I, I didn't have all of that information right then. But we had um, 38 people that went down on a bus in March of 1965 to go do voter registration and to do the march. And um, like I say, Jack Mogelson was one of the, the leaders of it. But the interesting thing was out of the 38 people, we had a lot of ministers and rabbis and stuff. We had about 13 to 19 students. I was a freshman then, and so they were talking about uh, Earl Craig and myself were the two minority instructor, two minority students. He was a graduate student, I was a freshman. And then we had uh, Judy Larson, who was president of the Students for Integration. Uh, we had the um, uh, Dan, who wrote for the Minnesota um, daily or the newspaper that we had back then at school. We had two junior CLA students. We had two uh, uh, sophomore CLA students. And so it's, it, and this is really kind of interesting, just to give you some perspective of what was going on in 1965 at the University of Minnesota. There were 48,000 people at the University of Minnesota. There were 100 African Americans. Out of the 100 African Americans, the majority of them were in the College of uh, uh, General College, the College of Education, and most of them were the football players, the basketball players, the track players. There were five of us in CLA, the College of Liberal Arts. So it kind of gives you some perspective of what was going on here in Minnesota um, and, and the kind of leadership and the things that we were developing. So long story short, for some of you that don't really know, uh, the Civil Rights Movement and the march from Selma to Montgomery, there were actually three marches. Um, the first march took place on March 7, 1965, Bloody Sunday, when 600 civil rights marchers were attacked by state and local police at Billy Clubs and Tear Glass. You see that on TV. The second march took place on March 9th, and only the third march, which we were participating in, we went down on a bus and we were able to get there, which began on March the 21st. And we marched 54 miles, and we averaged 10 miles a day. And it was hot down there. That's the only thing I can tell you I remember really well. <laughs> Leaving Minnesota in March and going down there, it was hot. And, I, you know, when I tell people the story, it was just, for me, it was just really interesting because I remember Dr. King flying in in a helicopter. This is the true story. <laughs> and to start the march with us. And then he's on and off because he's negotiating, you know, with the policymakers back and forth. But the young people, we were marching, uh, and it, we, like I say, we averaged about 10 miles a day. We camped out at nighttime in little tents or in sleeping bags. And one of the interesting things I really enjoyed about it, and people laugh at me when I say this, 
they had these little shanty houses along the way. And they were like what would be equivalent to us as grocery stores. And you'd go run in there, and in the store, they had fresh baked goods. I mean, you know, these were people that were running a store, and they were baking the things that you're going to buy daily. And the interesting piece that I liked best was I had, they, for some of you that may realize this, they, in the old days, they had these little Paramount pies they used to make in the Paramount tin. And the people down there would reuse the tins and make sweet potato pies and peach cobbler. And so anyway, I'm, I, now I, in my younger days, I was a track star. So, so I would stop and get some of these sweet potato pies and peach cobblers, and I'm marching with the group. And they were really good. And then I would literally run back while the march was moving forward. Now, you know, there's you know, thousands of us marching, so it wasn't like we were running. It was moving really far fast. I'd run back and get another pie or another uh, sweet potato pie or peach cobbler and eat it. Being young, you know, we're eating everything, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, that, just, just to give you some semblance of what we were doing. Well, when we're, when we're marching, the nice thing, because I was involved with the NAACP, is a lot of the southern kids that were down there were people I knew from the NAACP. So I was able at nighttime, you remember there was only two of us that were people of color out, out of our group, I was always running into somebody I knew from the NAACP. So I'd go over to wherever their tent was or go over to wherever their sleeping bag was and we would talk and, and stuff and see how things were going. And they would bring me up to date on what was happening in their area because we had came from all over the, the south and the, and the north. And so anyway, long story short, we, we, we are marching, we're getting the information. I'm sitting down, Aaron Henry, the third, if you guys Google any of this stuff. He was the son of Aaron Henry, which is a big NAACP leader in Mississippi. And so we were good friends, and so he would tell me what was going on in Mississippi. Andre McKissick, who was the daughter of Floyd McKissick, who was the big NAACP leader in North Carolina, she'd sit down and she'd let me know what was going on over there. And so it was kind of nice. I had an advantage over the people that were on the bus with me from Minnesota because I was connected to a lot of these people on the march. So they were daily keeping me up and we'd be walking. And as you're walking, I mean, they had 2,000 National Guard people, they had FBI, they had, you know, all these un unmarked U.S. Marshals, some, you know, in, uni in uh, uniform, some plain clothes, um, just to try to provide some safety for us during the march. And during this whole time, you could just feel the enthusiasm, the singing of the songs. Um, you know, there was just so much emotion gone with this march. And I, I tell you, you know, you really get involved, you get up, up to speed with it, and you think, wow, you know, we're really part of something. And we're there trying to get voters' rights. That's what we were trying to do. They weren't letting the African Americans vote down there. And yet they had huge populations of them. And, um, so it was, that, that's really kind of nice because, and I have some pictures now, I have to explain this to you. My grandson put a PowerPoint together, and I don't know how to do all of this to, to show you pictures while I'm talking, but I'll show you the pictures. It just may not go along with what I'm talking about. <laughs> but but, but we'll, we'll get through that. But um, so anyway, as we're sitting there and we're going through all of these things and we're trying to, uh, the people down there from the south are really, they're involved, but they're a little reluctant because they live there. So they're scared and they feel empowered because here's all these people coming, but there's that sensitivity that when we leave, they're still there. So you can get that sense about, oh, okay, we're glad you're here. We hope you can stay long enough that we can get something done. <laughs> so that we can improve our lives and stuff like that. So, as I say, as, as we're walking along and, and doing this march, um, as we get closer to Montgomery, um, my friends at nighttime, I would leave, and it was real hard, and it says in the articles that I have from our daily newspaper at the University of Minnesota, it was a little hard to keep us organized. It wasn't like we were all together. <laughs> and I was always off because I was going with the group. And,
So I actually got to go into Montgomery through the back to the, where the blacks live in part of Montgomery and actually sit down and have dinner with families that were there. I, I was very blessed to have these opportunities and to listen to the families explain to me the hardships that they were going through and the fact that all they wanted to do was to have a voice and to help make, at that point, just a voice, but in essence to try to make policies, to help get you know, things where they could improve their housing situations, where they could improve their job situations. And this kind of ties back to, because if you remember, I was also on the March on Washington in 63, and that was all about jobs. So between trying to work with the people that were trying to get jobs, and then now you're down south, and most of these people don't have the best jobs, and they're living on a small amount of money, and they're sustaining their families. And that, I mean, it was just, you know, it was, to me, it was very moving to see how close they were as a family, how close they were as a community, and how dedicated they were to try to stay on task to just get voting rights so that they could have some power. So, all of this was going on. I'm in, I'm in Montgomery at nighttime. Uh, when, when the guys back heard me, they said, what are you doing in there? And I said, listen, these are my friends, you know, and they're taking me to their family's houses. It may not have been their immediate house. It may have been an uh, extended family member's house. And sitting to talk and get that information from the, the people that lived there, actually lived there. And, um, but it was, I mean, just if you can sense the feeling that there was going on of, you're marching, and here you've got National Guard people, you've got Army troops, you've got FBI, you've got all of these people who are trying to make the route safe for us to get there. And you all saw the pictures when they crossed the bridge. Interestingly for us, our, we were there for the five days. We weren't there to actually, the bus that took us was bringing us back, um, so we didn't get to go over the bridge, even though I was in, in Montgomery <laughs> more than probably the people that were walking over the bridge <laughs> at nighttime going in. And, um, but it was just, if you can imagine, people were, they held signs up, niggers go home, and, and just all kinds of obscenities on the signs that they were holding up, um, spitting on you when you walk by. I mean, it, it wasn't a pleasant walk. Um, and, and so these things were happening, and and you're getting the sense of what's, what's really going on. And, you, and I couldn't understand, why was there so much anger about people that the blood was same as theirs? The only thing different was the skin color. I mean, from Minnesota, I just didn't get it. You know, and so this was, I, I share that with you so you get a sense of what's going through my mind as I'm walking down there and, and, and seeing this. And um, like I say, all these little shanty sh stores that were along the way, um, these people, if you sat and talked to them, they'd get up early in the morning to start baking the goods so that they could put them in the stores to sell. And I'm telling you, I mean, that's, I, you could tell one thing I liked the best was the food. <laughs> but, um, I mean, it really was. It, it, was, it was really interesting. But the, the bottom line was the enthusiasm and the interest that we as college students wanted to learn, to understand, to get, to get that breath of what is going on. Why, why is it so hard for us that are all here not to be able to get along? And um, when you sat and you talked to them and, and you just saw there was no rhyme or reason, no rational reason why we could not get the basic things that everybody else had. Yet when you go into town, and I, I'm in at nighttime now, when you go into town at nighttime and you're in the, quote, black section, the African-American section, you, you know, you had a real vibrant community, a real, you know, the barber shops, the, the little stores, the trinket stores, all of them were right there. So, I mean, that, that, that's one of the things that, um, you know, I can share with you that was going on. I want, now I'm going to try to do this. <laughs> This is, um, to, to bring you up when I started out with the NAACP, this is a leadership conference, and these are Northwest Airlines stewardess, and they had came to do a regional leadership training, and it was about jobs. 
That's the main thing was about jobs, economic development. And that's the key thing that we have to have today. That's what's separating us, as we know, with the gap that's going on. So this is real apropos on that. And these are the leaders. These are some of the national leaders that were here. Um, and you can see the paper was in 1965. This was in June. So this is when I came back from the march. And we brought in national leaders. Mark's, Matt Stark, and I have a letter that he wrote to uh, Dr. Dr. King, to Hosea Williams, and he, he said that he wanted to invite Dr. King to come speak at a convocation at Hamlin University um, and the University of Minnesota uh, so that he could help raise money for the Southern Christian Leadership Council so that more people could continue to go down and do the marches and help to do voter registration and things like that. And so I still, I have the actual letter. I, I, I keep everything. My poor husband said my house is going to fire hazard someday. <laughs> But I, I say that to you because these are some of the things. And, and that, you can see the time where this is in June of 65. Um, this is a little out of sequence. Uh, this is actually the St. Paul Pioneer Dispatch. When, when, for all of you that really don't know the history, there used to be an evening St. Paul paper. <laughs> and it was the Dispatch. And I actually have the paper. But anyway, you can see it's a little damaged. But in 1967, I um, was on the board. I'd been on it for six years. I, was, I had had it to the max. And I said in here, we've passed over 470 laws, and nobody's enforcing one of them. I quit. And so I was a little radical then. Um, but that's the essence of what this magazine says. And Ermin Bazingo was the president of the adult NAACP uh, branch right here. And so um, there was a lot of this going on within the NAACP at that time with the young people who were just fed up. I mean, we've marched, we've demonstrated, we've tried to do everything in a peaceful manner to get laws changed and get people their rights, and yet we weren't able to get that accomplished. And I think I'm a little short on patience. Um, and that's why at that point um, I resigned. Uh, from the uh, National Board. Um, these were the presidents of the NAACP, uh, Calvi Kaplan and um, um, Arthur Spring, um, it was Spurgeon. He was the, they have the Spurgeon Award, which is the biggest award the NAACP gives. He was the president at that time. Here's um, Humphrey, who, as you're well aware, worked to get the Voter Registration Act passed. And he was here, and as he says, he's with his uh, Minnesota uh, youth board member. And I standing around making sure that he acknowledged that I was with this group. Harry Davis, for some of you that know, Chet, uh, who was head of the Minneapolis NAACP. But you can see the number of young people that were involved in the movement. Now this is just, a, you see back, remember we had 650 members. When people came up here, they saw young people involved and engaged and knowledgeable and willing to talk and articulate about the issues and concerns that were going on, not only here, but in the, in the, in the world, in, in the United States. So that's uh, some of those pictures. This picture, this is really out of sequence. This is a picture, talk about historic. This is Humphrey's plane, and this was the group that went to Washington, D.C. to get the first HUD grant for the state of Minnesota. Sister Giovanni, uh, Allie Mae Hampton, myself, uh, the Catholic, the, the black ministers. Um, I mean, I'm telling you, for a young person, at the time I didn't realize that this was important. <laughs> I, I realize it now, having been in planning. And, and how important it was to get this money. But um, I share that with you just so you get some perspective of things that were leading up to getting this march and working on voter registration down in Mississippi, in uh, Alabama. Here's the leadership of the Midwest region, which is Minnesota, Iowa, North Dakota, South Dakota. Most of it is Minnesota and Iowa. <laughs> um, and here I am, Don Lewis, a lot of you that work for the city, used to be the human rights director. Um, with uh, Humphrey, there's Chet, 
And these are all the regional uh, presidents that they had. But you notice Humphrey was always there with us. And when we sat down with him, when he came back to Minnesota, he would meet with us. We would share what we learned, what we saw. And he was, as you're well aware, he was very vocal at carrying those messages all the way up to Congress. So I just wanted to, to share that with you. This is, and this is really kind of interesting. I don't want you all to read all this and think I'm crazy. <laughs> For all of you that have yearbooks, when you were in school. This is my last page of my yearbook. And I was madly in love with this Jewish kid that was in Latin with me. I was going to be a doctor. <laughs> and I was madly in love with him. So I'm, I, I saved my back page for him to write something. And as he says in here, he said, I mean, this isn't the place for a discussion public like that on interracial relationships of any sort. <laughs> now, I share that with you because this guy, today, he's a professor at Harvard. So at least I picked good ones, didn't I? <laughs> but, uh, <clears throat> but we had, he goes on to talk about, um, I think you're, <coughs> excuse me, I have a call. Your generation, you have, have to be, I can't read it. But anyway, it says your generation of Negroes is going to be tested with the greatest burden of weight in this modern day of history of that race. And uh, he goes on. I mean, it just, I mean, stop and think. This is a high school kid. <laughs> and he understands the stuff that's going on and, and, and is able to write and articulate about it. But um, I just wanted to give you that kind of overview. I want to make sure you guys, if you have any questions that you can ask me, um, hopefully I can kind of engage you. Um, I don't like just giving presentations. Nobody gets to ask any questions. And I've given three this week. <laughs> yes? Can you talk a little bit about if you were afraid when you were walking on the march? I mean, you talked a lot about like people just standing on the sidelines wanting to harm you. And you were just a young girl. I mean, I can imagine being terrified of walking. I must have been the dumbest person out there. I, I, ne I, never, I never thought about it. I mean, I was on a mission. It wasn't about me. I was willing to make that sacrifice. I mean, in my heart. I'm not saying that to you. I mean, I never thought about being afraid. I was doing this for the right reasons and making sure that, you know, we could get folks the rights that they should have in this country. And um, I, I, I have to be honest. I never thought about it. I mean... Well, Where were your parents in all of this? But surely they must have been anxious. Oh my God, yes. <laughs> I got Rita's here. He could tell you my parents were going crazy. I was adopted by my grandparents. And my grandmother was from Kentucky and my grandfather was from Texas. So they had a lot of history about the South. And here I am, this northern high yellow person, um, you know, who's really involved in the civil rights movement. And um, I kept saying, I want to go do this, I want to do that. They were scared to death. They put my life, they, as they said every day, we were a very religious family. My, my life in the hands of the Lord. They said, the Lord's going to watch over you. And, uh, you know, just don't do anything crazy, which they always were suspect with me on. Um, but, no, that's, they were. They were really afraid. And, like I say on this march, when I went south, just to share with you some things, I got down south. And I came back home. Now, some of you may not remember this. The old crystal uh, oil cans. And I came back and I said, Mom, they got red dirt. I mean, I didn't know that, you know, I thought up here everything was black dirt, and here down there it was red dirt. So I'm, I'm sharing with you some of the things that I was learning, even about the ecology and how things were working, and it was just a whole new perspective. Oh, um, So what's your views on this next, let's say the millennium generation, and their future involvement in carrying work forward? You know, and particularly with all our change in social media and so forth. Do you have some views about that? You know, thanks for asking that question. 
Um, I teach at two colleges right now. And um, this is a very entitled group of young people. They, you know, they feel that they're entitled to a lot of stuff. And when I try to engage them into doing, stepping out of their safety net, they're a little reluctant to do that. Now, I'm only talking about in the, the ones that I come in, at, you know, have contact with. I'm also president of the St. Paul NAACP uh, National, I mean, the um, YWCA of St. Paul Board of Directors. So we're dealing with young people there, too. And it's, it's real interesting because they have more technology than we could ever imagine that they could do stuff with. And you keep seeing the ones that do real well, but you don't see the masses, the ones that are right there. And they don't, a lot of them don't know their history. Uh, if you don't know where you came from, you don't know where you're going. And I, I tell them that all the time. And, and I always tell them, engage. Go st step out of your safety net. Get to meet different people. Get to understand different cultures. Ask questions. Don't be afraid to ask questions. But, you know, it's, it's like I say, it's real interesting because they're so busy doing this that I think there's a communications network that's breaking down as far they can do all of this, but it's that interpersonal relationship. That's what I had during the march. It was interpersonal relationships. It was really getting to understand what the situation was, talking to people that were involved, getting engaged. And maybe they're doing that on social media. As you can tell, I'm technologically challenged. But, <laughs> but um, you know, maybe they're doing that. But we've, we've got to get them to see, touch, and feel. And, and, and then when we get them engaged and they, and they get that sense, that's when we're going to be successful as a community, as a state, as a country. And, um, you know, you just see the little, I mean, on TV today, what, it, who just, what the guy just paid $16 billion for something. And it's a faster way to show pictures and stuff and talk to each other. How about pick up the phone and call somebody, you know? I mean, you know what I'm saying? How do, how do you keep that contact going on? Um, you don't get a sense doing this of what somebody's really feeling unless they're very good at writing when you can get a sense of what they're saying. Exactly, exactly. So that, I mean, that's, that's what worries me today. And as a country, we're falling behind the rest of the world. You know, because they're still, they're, their masses are still communicating. They're still touching. Look at, look at the riots going on right now. These people are engaged. Um, so, I, you know, we've got to work on that. And, and I, you know, constantly, I'm always, I my passion is young people. I'm constantly challenging young people, constantly. Yes? Do you see, um, like with the young people you're dealing with, do you see like an optimism or a pessimism or like an in-between, you know, regarding the future, their futures. Well, it's kind of interesting, especially in Minnesota. You know, I always say it's the land of Humphrey, except I'm not seeing that Humphrey feeling coming out. Um, you, you don't see them engaging in a way where they feel, like when, I, I te when I'm teaching a lot of the kids, my students, some of them come from well-to-do families. Others come from very poor. That middle-class group, as you and I know, just isn't there right now. It's kind of very small. And so those that are from the poor side are having a hard time adjusting on how can I be included to move up at least to the middle class. And those with all the money or the upper part how do I disperse it? You see some, how do I disperse it so we can get to that building that middle class? So it's that combination that, that, that you see. Um, we've got to get jobs. I mean, we, t you know, we talk about the achievement gap, we talked about the unemployment rate, we talk about the incarceration rate. If you gave people jobs, they're gonna learn skills and they're gonna feel like they're contributing something. And that's the piece that pe I don't get a sense the young people feel that they're contributing something. Yes. Um, do you feel like from your time period up until the generation, I, I won't say the generation, I'll say people as a whole, do you see us really, from all that you fought for and everybody from NWCP, do you feel people 
nowadays, like to us as a society, we really take it serious, the movement that you had, that we went through to get to this process? It's as far as the rules and, you know, things that you guys are fighting for in the laws and housing, and do you see that still in this day? Do you see it happening? Is it really working, or is there still this little underlining that we don't want to discuss or we won't discuss for fear or taboo or whatever? Well, you hear all the time. We got systemic discrimination, and it's systems. It's system. I, I, I think back, here's a classic example. The GED degree. Up until December of last year, if you took the GED degree and you passed the section, you could go back and take the sections that you didn't pass. Now, if you don't pass the whole thing, you've got to go back and take the whole test again. Are we making it easier? I mean, it's just little things, systematic things. How, how do we really want to engage people so they can be successful? Um, I mean, it's just little, like I say, I could go through a, a lot of others, you know, housing situations. You know, people got tied up in the, the uh, interest rate deal, you know. Couldn't somebody have helped us early on to make it seem that, you know, we don't need to take out those adjustable rate mortgages and there's another way that we could do it? I mean, it's just, it's system things that come back and hurt us. And those are the things that, it, until we can work on changing the systems, we're going to have some issues here. And I, there's a lot of people here that we, you all know, you're sitting in, the county and the city, you know some of the systems that you know aren't working or that could be better adjusted. And then if you speak up, does anyone listen to you? I don't know. I don't know. Um, I'm not going to stand here <laughs> and publicly try to say what I think uh, as far as how the systems work. Uh, having been with government for 44 years and having how to work to change systems or improve systems, it's not an easy thing to do. And it takes a lot of tenacity and it takes a lot of people that are committed to get it done. And a lot of people that are gonna stand up before the city councils, stand up before the legislatures. I mean, I mean, it, you, know, you know, we don't see those rallies anymore like we used to see where you got 600 or 1,000 or 2,000 people showing up, you know. So, yes. Uh, from the time of the march up, up to until today, do you think that we have reached much as far as moving forward in society? With the, ele the election of Barack Obama as the president of the United States, uh, something you would not have thought of uh, 60 years ago, do you think we have reached much? It's on one tape. <laughs> be politically correct. <laughs> um, it was an honor for us to see a person of color, African American at that, to become president. My president can't get a lot done. <laughs> you know, I mean, he went in with a lot of expectations and directions from the public. And, uh, you, know, you know, we're having a hard time getting things passed through Congress and, and uh, you know, committees and, and stuff like that. So I think that's the best politically correct answer I can give you on that. <laughs> but I have hope. And that's one thing that we all have to have. We all have to have hope, but what we need to bring with that hope is what skills and knowledge do you have that you can help bring to the table, either through your position or through young people or through organizations, <laughs> that can help to improve the society and the things that we're engaged with. We can't sit back. A lot of people are so frustrated right now that they're sitting back. This isn't the time to sit back. I hate to say this, it's actually a time to start marching again. <laughs> you know, because we need to get back out on the street and let the politicians know these are the issues that are important to us. Get off your seat, get out, Talk to us, tell us how we can help you make the, pass that legislation so we can improve the things that are holding us back. And that's the stuff we've got to do.
But don't you think that needs to start with the much younger generation? Because the boomers have kind of had a, I mean, I think we all have to be involved, but the boomers have kind of had their say, and they're continuing to press. But I think the younger generations have to be brought in. I agree. I, I agree. But we're doing this. We got to talk. We got to relate. We got to engage. And, and until we can get the younger people to engage, and, and, and I, I wanted to get a group of young people together lately, recently, to just say, what is it that you're interested in? Today, right now, what is your number one interest? And do you feel that you're successful in what it is you are interested in? And if not, what can you and your group do that I can assist you with, having had the experience, so that you can be successful? If you can get them engaged right now and inspired in one thing, one thing that they're interested in, we're starting the movement. And the support, the yes. support that we need to get because the schools, you know, one well, of my son, they, he was told, well, you don't have to pass these standard tests to graduate because he had a learning disability. And I said, no, he's going to take them until he can't pass them anymore. And then he's a graduate and a college graduate. So it takes us as the parents, as the adults, to constantly support and push them along the way. You know, and then they're also saying, well, I need a break. I say, you don't get breaks until you complete something. You know, you keep pushing until you get it done. And then maybe you can sit back and take a vacation. You're exactly right. John? Yeah, during, during the march, as a, young, as a young person, the organizers, how did they prepare you? Did they say, we're going to march this long, this how many days, you will need this, 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 and this. You're going to face this. You're going to face that. How do they prepare you for that? Can that, can that be done today? Yeah, well, thank you for that question. Yeah, it's interesting because, like I say, Jack Mogelson, he was down there for three months, and he was one to put our, our march together. And so he came back and told us what were some of the issues that were going on, how they were treating the people, and what we could look forward to. And he, and he also tried to make us feel safe in the sense that he said, well, you're going to have the National Guard there, and you're going to have, you know, the militia there, and you're going to have all these people there that they're going to help to keep you safe. You know, back then, and it's a, a, a good question, I mean, did anyone think about snipers? I mean, today, I mean, it's a big deal. Everybody, you know, and back then, I don't think anybody ever mentioned to us about snipers or, you know, those kinds of threats. But... Um, you know, they prepared us, told us what to bring with our sleeping bags and the, the things that we would have. Um, they told us we'd be sleeping overnight. Um, so they engaged us with that. But as far as, you know, they, they just made us think that, okay, there's people there that are going to actually try to help us to do the march. Yeah, you were talking about engagement in, in young people. And, and I, you know, I agree with that because I do a lot with uh, the Indian kids. Uh, and I, I think from the standpoint of looking at society, we're a diverse society. I mean, things are changing. It's going to be, you know, we're going to have, you know, less and less of a, of a, of a white population, more of a mixed population. So the engagement for me, and I think, you know, if I've talked to the Indian kids about, and I'm sure you talked to, to your folks, is that they've got to get more involved in the political process as well. I mean, we've got a few people out there now that are involved. You know, my buddy went from Saint, uh, from Colorado was, was, was the Indian senator, Ben Nighthurst Campbell. But we need more of those folks. They're involved. And, and it doesn't have to be you know, one party or the other, just to have them involved and engaged because they are in Congress and they're in the Senate and you know, city councils, people don't want to be engaged or they aren't and they're you know, on the back to this stuff. And I think that's not going to work. I think it's really interesting. I'm, I'm all excited about Minneapolis right now. I mean, the Somali population, the Hmong population. I mean, the immigrant population has came from countries and environments that have had things to hold them back. And they are over here in America and they're looking at the American system and they figured out, you know, we need to get engaged. And I, if you just read the paper today, um, you know, Phyllis Kahn, 42 years, here's a young guy over there, Somali guy that's, that got the delegates and you and I know what happens at a caucus. It's all about the delegates. So, you know, they figured it out. Now, what, what we don't know, and when I talk to the young people that I work with, 
is what do we want to do with it? What do you want to do with it? And that, that's the piece I don't get yet. I haven't, I heard, I haven't heard them, ex and I'm talking about the young people, articulate that piece. Yes. Did you have any opportunities to have any face to face time with Dr. King during the years? Maybe not during the march, but later on. And what kind of, how was he on the personal public? Yeah, thank you for asking that question. It, yes, I did. I, being on the board of the NAACP, when we had those leadership meetings, and you had, like I say, Thurgood Marshall and Dr. King and Horace Williams and, and all of those different leaders from SNCC and SCLC. We got to sit down, and as a young person on the board, I was very privileged to sit and to listen to them. And they were very in-depth thinkers. I mean, they really were committed. Um, a lot of them were ministers, so they had a lot of faith ability that they would bring to the meeting. Uh, but they were very committed to engage, and um, they, they were all about business. And, and they were constantly saying, and being one of the few youth people that was at the table, we have to keep our young people focused. We have to keep them focused. We have to keep them, because when you look at the marches, you saw the older ones, but the marches were the younger people that were actually marching. Come up with the decision with all the hatred that a race of people had for you, and you, you guys marched in peace. I mean, you know, I've seen the pictures and read the stories, and I'm not from that era, but how was that? as far as your heart and soul is concerned, to see your friends as, and you know, it was not just people of color, but, you know, everybody just fighting for a cause. How was it to see them being heard? And how, how did that, did it make you stronger? Did it make you better? Or? That's a wonderful question. I watch, I have movies from the Civil Rights Movement, and I watch them with my grandkids. And I watch them, and I start crying. And my grandkids ask me, Grandma, why are you crying? I said, because my friends died to give you the right to vote or to give you the right to do this. And you guys aren't stepping up to the plate. I tell them that all the time. But they see the emotion that's in me because I did watch my friends die, some of my young friends that got hurt. Uh, may maybe not directly in this march, but in other activities where I get an email from somebody at the NAACP down in Georgia, and they were, they were beaten. They didn't have the technology to send you the pictures like you do today, but you got the sense of what was really going on. So that, that's, yeah, I, you just have to, that passion is right there. So I, I hope I was able to give you a sense of what this march was like and how it impacted me and how it impacted the young people that came from Minnesota, but also the people that we knew, that I knew from the NAACP that I met down there. And um, yeah, as you can tell, I'm committed. Uh, I'm going to my 50-year class reunion <laughs> this summer. <laughs> and and I, I'm looking forward to seeing all of the, my classmates and what they've done, because as we see all the things that they're doing, they're still engaged, you know. My young love of my life is, trying to educate young people at Harvard. <laughs> Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.